I read this week that 20% of all fatal accidents happen in cars. 17% of all accidents happen at home. 16% of all accidents happen in a boat, a train, or a plane. 15% of all accidents happen uh, to pedestrians. Uh, so uh, be careful where you walk. And um, one one thousandth of one percent of all accidents happen in a worship service. So you are very, very safe today. Okay? So I just wanted you to just kind of just clear your minds and clear your hearts. And uh, if you have your Bibles, if you have your sermon section, we have um, uh, most of the scriptures that I'll be referring to. Um, the main scriptures will be on the, on the screen, and they're right there in your bulletin today. I'm going to kind of conclude this little series I started a few weeks ago, and we opted out last week and listened to Craig Rochelle. How many quit trying, and you're starting to train now, huh? That was pretty great, wasn't it, huh? Just, just, just quit trying. Just stop trying. And just start training. That's a, why didn't I think of that, you know? It took Craig to, to tell us all of that. But anyway, we're just thankful that you're here today. So I want to just kind of wrap up this series that we've called Keeping Hope Alive. And uh, we're going to refer back to another one of uh, the illustrations of Jesus and um, what took place with um, um, with him, his disciples, and those that he was with. And um, it's just wonderful how all the years I've looked at these scriptures, and it's just, this is just something powerful about the Word of God and how God speaks to us through his Spirit. And yet, here I am, after being a Christ follower nearly all of my life, I'm finding some new truths from these old truths that have been laid out for us many, many, many years ago. The story this morning we're going to talk about is the miracle, um, one of the big miracles of Jesus, and it's found in, in three of the four Gospels. It's found in Matthew, it's found in Mark, and it's found in John. The miracle of Jesus walking on the water. And um, you've heard about it, you've um, read it before, and... Um, this uh, took place, you know, right after he fed the 5,000, and not with just 5,000, it was 5,000 men. So, you know, they're saying, scholars say there's probably 15, 20,000 people that he fed that day. Um, and then, um, you know, there were some that were really, really troubled. The religious leaders of that day, you know, they began to make it political, and they thought Jesus was making this whole thing political with what he was doing. Isn't that just how the human thinks? You know, and that hasn't changed. We still hear those kind of things even today uh, in the political arena of life. And, and so here we are. We are seeing Jesus um, after he does this. And then there's this little bit of, a, of murmuring and accusing and, and, and political uh, staging going on. So, you know, I don't know if Jesus said, I'm out of here. But he said, I'm going to go pray. <laughs> so he leaves that scene and he goes to the mountain to pray. And when he goes to the mountain to pray, he says to his disciples, he says to, he says to Peter, John, he says, yeah, and you, you, you guys just get in the boat. You guys get in the boat. I'm going to go pray. And you guys get in the boat. Obviously, Jesus knew exactly all that was going to take place. He knew what he was doing. He set them up for what was go about to happen. And so, so we have the story. And I'm going to pick up with the reading here uh, on the screen and also in your sermon section. So we pick up the scripture where it says, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and head and go on ahead to, uh, of him to uh, Bethesda. While he dismissed the crowd, he dismissed the crowd, after leaving them, he went up alone to the mountainside to pray. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them about the fourth watch of the night, and he went out to them. Walking on the lake, he was about to pass by them, but when he saw them walking, when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought it was a ghost. Huh, wow. They cried out because they 
were all that, that they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them uh, and said, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them, and when the winds died down, they, came compl- uh, they were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. Okay, now we're going to walk back through that very, very slow, verse by verse, and we're going to pull the story together as we look at it here this morning. When I look at this and I say, okay, I've read that before, but there are so many truths that I am going to just grab a hold of and pick out of this this morning simply because they're all right, right here. They're right here. And as we look at the things that, the lessons that he's teaching them and he's teaching us, it's going to really, really help us to understand way, way, way more than we understood before as to what takes place when we have these symptoms that we're sinking. And I know, I talk to people all the time. They say, you know what? I don't know how I'm going to get out of this situation. You know, things have been pretty tough. They've been pretty rough. Um, uh, I've got myself in this situation. Um, Some of it was of my making. Some of it was not. Some of it just happened because of the situation and the, the circumstances that took place. But there's nothing fun about having a sinking feeling. There's nothing fun about saying, okay, I think I'm losing more than I'm winning. I think, um, I think I, I, I'm getting deeper than getting out of the deep. So it's just a horrible, horrible feeling. So as we look at this, we have put the answers to the, I didn't have any fill in the blanks on this first section. How I know I'm sinking, how I know I'm sinking, well, we have it from, the, from these verses here. And, and, uh, and, and John, John says um, uh, to us, we know we're sinking uh, when I can't see my way. When I can't see my way. And we have it here in, in, in John chapter 6. It says, by now it was dark, so they couldn't see. Now, I don't know how many of you have really been in ever, ever in the pitch, pitch dark. It's hard to do that in our nation because, you know, even if you think it's dark and, you know, and and. and, and Everything is still, you know, still you see maybe a star or you see a plane go over or whatever. But pitch dark is, is, I guess, crazy. I don't know. Maybe you've been in some kind of haunted house or something and it was pitch dark and you couldn't even see your hand in front of you. You know, there's nothing fun about being in the dark, you know. And uh, remember those games that you played with your brothers or sisters or they played with you, you know, in the dark and ooh, 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 try to scare you. And you screamed out for mom and dad and because the dark is scary. Well, you know, you know, you're sinking when you can't see your way. And, um, and John tells us here um, by now it was dark. Um, I know I'm sinking when I feel like I'm on my own. And that's another horrible feeling. To feel like that nobody in the world knows what you're going through. And even you, even though it's not probably true, even you can convince yourself they don't even care. Okay. And then you can just keep taking it, taking it further and further and further. When you're on your own, that's not a happy, happy feeling. But you know you're sinking when you feel you're on your own. And the Bible tells us here that Jesus had not yet joined them. Okay. So they were on their own. Jesus was not with them at that point. And maybe what you're going through today, you say, you know what? I've got to do this by myself. I don't really have anybody else. You know, it's my deal. It's my deal. And, and, and there's nobody else would even understand, even if I would try to explain it to them. Um, did you ever hear a parent say to you because you were, going to, you were going to make a decision? And they said this, if you made that decision, I want you to know. You're on your own. As what they were saying to us was, I'm not going to help you out. <clears throat> now, how many parents said that then end up helping them out? Don't raise your hands. <laughs> when you're on your own, it's a sinking feeling, okay? And then we also see, you know, you're thinking, you're sinking when you feel like um, you're out of your comfort zone. Hardly anybody likes to be out of their comfort zone. 
If I would take and interview 25 of you this morning and just set you at a table and, uh, and ask you, what, give me three of your comfort zones, and then I try to give an alternative to your comfort zone, you would probably say, ah, that sounds good, but that's not for me. Why? Because it's much easier to be in your comfort zone. But they were out of their comfort. The Bible tells us here that they were not in the middle of the lake. They were in the middle of the lake, and things were not going well at all. Also, when the strong forces are against me, that's another sign that I am sinking. And the Bible tells us here that they were tossed and battered around in this storm. And, um, and John tells us that the waters grew tough and rough. And then Mark says uh, the winds were against them. So things weren't pretty. Things weren't good. So obviously they knew that they were sinking. And then the last thing here, uh, I'm struggling, and, but I'm still failing. Okay? I'm struggling. I'm trying to get out of this. I'm trying to get out of this. And it says here, they were serious in serious trouble, rowing, ro- rowing hard and against them, all the winds and all the waves. So there was a struggle going on, but still they were losing. That is a pretty good definition of a sinking, sinking feeling. Every time we go through a storm, and I remember six or eight years ago, I preached, uh, probably longer than that, I preached a sermon on, on the storm of life, and it was a complete sermon on, and it wasn't even uh, according to these, these scriptures. But when we go through a storm, as a Christ follower, as a Christ follower, and, and I, I really want you to catch this, when we go through a storm as a Christ follower, there is something in that storm that God is trying to tell us or teach us. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say this. You may never know what it is. There are some storms that we go through and we say, why? I don't understand it. There's no way. I don't. And you know what? It might not. You may never know in this life why you went through that storm. I'm serious. But most storms that we go through, there's a situation where God is trying to, God is trying to teach us what to do in that storm. So as I think about the storms of life, and I think about this story, there's some exciting things that take place in this scripture that really, really helps me and gives me great, great courage. What does Jesus do for you? And what does Jesus do for me when we are sinking? Okay? This might be the part that you need this morning. Maybe that first part is, a, you know, it's not, okay. But, but this might be the part. What, what does Jesus do for me? What does my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, do for me when I'm sinking? Because he knows all things. Nothing is a surprise to him. So let's just look at this, and I think this will really, really help us. Number one, Jesus prays for me before it happens. Someone said one time, I wonder what Jesus is doing up in heaven. You know, wonder what, wonder what he is doing, you know. I think he's praying for us. I really think he's praying for us. We see that he left the crowd, dismissed the crowd. He says, I'm going to go to the mountain and pray. He says, disciple, he said, Peter, he, you, you guys get in the boat. Get out there, get in the boat. So here we are. We're in this situation, and we can understand that Jesus is praying for me. Matter of fact, he prays for us before it happens. And here's how I know that. There's no surprises. He knows all things. He knows everything about you before you were born, during your life, everything about us. So I'm going to say this morning, one thing, one thing that I really, really believe in this morning is Jesus, he prays for me before before it happens. He knew what was going to take place, so he had the advantage, even though they didn't know. And even though we don't know what our next storm's going to be, he has an advantage. He knows. 
And I can say with all of my heart, as I look back on the storms I've been through in my life, if you would do the same thing, as you have stayed in connection with God, you stayed in his word, you didn't give up on God, you didn't give up on your faith, you didn't throw in the towel spiritually, even though you didn't understand it, and even though I didn't understand it, one thing I am positively sure of, there was no reason for me to doubt but what Jesus already knew what was going to take place. He knew what was going to happen because he's trying to teach them a lesson. You know what? And most of us don't like to be taught those lessons. When we have a little one and, and we know very well if they don't listen to us, they're going to get hurt. But sometimes they have to get hurt. And we big kids. Jesus knows there's certain times that we need to learn some lessons. You know, and the question could be, wow, I think I've learned enough. I don't think I need any more lessons. I think I kind of get it. I don't think I need any more storms. Well, um, we don't know as much as God knows. So he knows exactly all that's going on, and he is praying for us in the middle of that storm. Number two, he notices my struggle. (laughs) Jesus saw the disciples straining at the oars. He saw them. He sees your struggle. He sees your apprehensions. He sees your insecurities. He sees when you just didn't do a well, a, a good job on that decision. He sees the struggle. And he notices the struggle. You know what? When I think of that, that just gives me another, another piece of, of, of encouragement because Sometimes we have people in our life and they don't know our struggle. And they don't want us to know. And there's times that we don't want them to know. How many times have you walked in here and you maybe have had a very, very ugly morning or an ugly week? But you walk in. How you doing? How you, oh, I'm great, doing great. Every once in a while, I cross my arms and I'll say, how are you really doing? And then someone says, why did you ask that for? Well, I I don't think you're really lying to me, but I understand nobody, nobody wants to be tagged as that person that is always a downer, right? Nobody does. Well, maybe some people do. (laughs) In the other churches, not here. Oh, you know, way down the street somewhere. But you know what? He knows. He knows your struggle. He notices your struggle. And there's times that we can notice. You know, we get to know a person pretty well, and we say, hmm, they're a little bit off today. eh, Something's just not quite right. So maybe you kind of get over it a little bit later and say, hey, come here, I'm going to talk to you. What's going on? Are you okay? Well, not really. What's going on? I'm having a little struggle. And then they'll say this. I'm glad you noticed. How did you know? Well, I don't know. Well, I'm glad you asked. Jesus knows your struggles. He notices it when nobody else does. That is very, very powerful. He pays attention to every single detail of your life. Job said, he sees everything I do and counts every step I take. Job said that. Yes, Job, the guy that had the ultimate, ultimate struggles. The Bible says this. Jesus is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. He was tempted in every way that we are. But he didn't sin. So he notices our struggles. Number three, the third thing that Jesus does while we're going through a storm is he comes at the moment of desperation. Okay. He comes to us when it's, I mean, now. Now, it's not just a struggle. It's not just a storm. Now we are desperate. We, we are desperate. 
You heard me tell the little story when my brother Mark locked himself in the trunk of that metropolitan car when he was little. And he first of all said, help, help, somebody help, somebody help. And the neighbor was sitting on the front porch across the street. And then finally he said, anybody, would anybody help? And the neighbor goes over and hits the button and gets him out of the trunk of that metropolitan car on a hot summer day. Well, Mark went, Mark went in through, through the back seat with no back seat in a metropolitan. He went through the back part and, and closed it, and he couldn't get out. You know what? Somebody help. Anybody help. Well, we can see here that he comes to us in the time when we're in most despair. Maybe you haven't gone to a person for help until you were absolutely out of every other option and you had to get some help. I've been there before. Oh, in my younger life, oh, there were some times, you know, I'd say, okay, I think I can do this. I think I can make this work. But when I realized I couldn't, then I had to humble myself and say, hey, I tell you what, I've got a really serious problem here. I need some help. Well, why didn't you ask before? Well, I was embarrassed. I didn't, I didn't think I should. And, and it, was just, it, was just, it was just a dumb thing that I did. No. Despair. In time of despair. And here's what it says in Mark. About the fourth watch of the night, he, Jesus, went out to them walking on the water. Now, the fourth watch is somewhere between 3 and 6 o'clock in the morning. Okay? Between 3 and 6 o'clock in the morning. How many times have you woke up at 3 o'clock and can't get back to sleep? Huh? You say, why? I just want to sleep. You know, I know. I mean, I could get up and go to work, but I don't want to yet. I still want to sleep a little bit. You know? And then, and then when you should get up, ah, oh, now you're really tired. You're sleeping good there, you know. Well, you know, this, they weren't sleeping. These guys were in despair. But between 3 and 6 o'clock is what was taking place. And you know what? Sometimes the storm blows us off schedule. And that's what would happen here. They should have been up there in a couple hours. It wasn't that far. But because of the storm, they were in trouble. They were in despair. They were, they were in a situation where they really, absolutely needed some big, big time help. Some of you right now, maybe the storm is getting worse. Maybe it's getting wilder. Maybe it's getting more weird. Maybe things are just, you're thinking, okay, I thought this was going to be over by now, but we're still going through this. I'm still going through this. And you're thinking, when is it ever, ever, ever going to end? That is a horrible, horrible feeling. John 14 says this. He says, I will not abandon you. I will not leave you as orphans in the storm. I will come to you. And that's another powerful, powerful lesson we have here. He was more interested in their character than their comfort. That's why they were in this storm. Jesus is trying to teach them some things. We want the comfort. We think our character is okay. Lord, I just want to be comfortable now. I want some comfort. But Jesus knew that he needed to work on their character more than their comfort. And that's a huge, huge point for us to remember when we are going through some of the storms of life. Number four, he showed me, he shows me his true identity, and I love this section here. It says, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified, thinking it was a ghost. And I'm not saying that was weird. I mean, you know, they were terrified, thinking it was a ghost. But Jesus immediately said this to them. Think about this. All right, they're in desperation. They're in the middle of the lake. The storm is raging. It's awful. They're afraid, everything. Now they see this person that's walking is, is probably a ghost. Now they're more afraid. And Jesus says this. Listen to it. Jesus said to them, immediately he said, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Let's stop right there. Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Two things I see in that statement. I see, first of all, I see... The challenge, don't be afraid. Oh, easy for you to say, don't be afraid. That's a challenge. 
The last thing you need me to say to you when you're in the middle of the storm is pat you on the back and say, oh, you'll be all right. Get out of here. <laughs> you're saying you have no clue what you're talking about. I'm not ready to hear that yet. So just don't do that. I mean, I know you mean well, but if a person's really going through a storm, don't just pat them on the back and walk by and say, oh, you'll be all right. No, that doesn't go over too well. I mean, you can say it to me if you want to, and I'll just say, that didn't go over very well. <laughs> Hello, all. You guys here? Okay. Anyway, Whew. maybe you're just really listening. You're tuned in, aren't you? Okay. So the challenge was don't be afraid. Okay? Don't be afraid. And then he gives them a reassurance. It is I. It is I. Now, I like this, this section about it is I. <clears throat> Remember back when Moses asked God, Lord, when I go to these people in Egypt and I tell them God spoke to me and they said, what's God's name? What am I supposed to say to them? And God says, <clears throat> just tell them that I am sent you. What? Just tell them that I am sent you. Well, that's pretty arrogant. Yeah, that's, yeah. The I am in the Greek means ego. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just tell I, I am. There's somebody that you know really, really well. Maybe it's your favorite, favorite coach, for an example. I don't know what else. I'm just thinking about this. And you're struggling with something. And then you go to that person that's struggling and say, hey, you know what? And, you're, and they'll happen to name your favorite coach. Coach so-and-so just says, you'll be all right. What? Who? Really? I am. Jesus says, just tell them I am sent me. Jesus says, I am. That's who he is. There's no other. There's no negotiating. There's no misunderstanding. 17 times Jesus says, ego ima, which is I am. I am. You know what? When you're in the storm, you don't need a plan. You need a person. When you're in a storm, you don't need a system. You need a savior. When you're in the storm, you don't need a goal. You need a God. And that's exactly what was going on here. I am. Don't be afraid. I want to reassure you. It's me. Whew. I'm glad it's not a ghost. We're glad it's you. Can you imagine the relief that came to them immediately? They had no clue. He was even close by. They knew he went up to pray. He dismissed the crowd, sent them out on the boat. And now he shows up walking on the water. You know why he can walk on the water? Because he made the water. And he can make water do whatever he wants to do. Why? Because he made water. If he wants to say, water, I want you to hold me up, water's going to hold him up. Why? Because he made the water. It's pretty powerful when you think about how powerful God is. So here he is, not a ghost, but it's I am. It's me. I am. There he is. Take courage because um, Jesus is with me. Courage is this. Courage is not the absence of fear. I want you to get this. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is when the motive is when the move ahead in spite of the fear. So in other words, in spite of the fear, I'm going to have courage to move through this. Fear is just, oh, oh I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to give up kind of a thing. Courage is, I'm not going to say I'm not afraid, but I'm going to take some courage and do it anyway. I'm going to do it anyway. You know, courage is when you do the right thing, even when it scares you to death. That's courage. And that's where these guys were. That's where these guys were. The courage that they had. As we think about these five things that 
Jesus gives us, the instructions that he gives us. He gives us courage because Jesus is with us. Number two, he helps us to understand that we need to take a risk in faith. And let me say that very, very gently this morning. Most people's character and most people's constitution is, is not to take a risk. Some people are risk takers. And uh, some, mo- most people are not. Play it safe. I uh, don't want to um, fail here. So I'm going to just play it, play it, play it very safe. There needs to be a risk. And let me show you what takes place here. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. It was risky, but he had courage. It was him. It was, oh, I'm here. I am here, is here. So Jesus is there. That gives him courage. And Jesus, after Peter said, Lord, if you, if you tell me, I want to obey. Jesus said, okay, Peter, come on over here. Walk, come on. And so he does. So there was, there was, some, there was some risk there. And to get through our storm, there's going to be times that we're going to have to take a risk. I read this last week, and it said this. Is, I bet Jesus was so pleased when Peter said, can I come out to you? Can I come out there and uh, be with you? And the Lord, um, it's scary, but I want to be with you. I want to be with you. As Peter Ask the question, I think Jesus was just thrilled, the fact that he asked that question. And think about this. I think Jesus is thrilled when we let him know that we want to be with him. Come on now. I think Jesus is thrilled when all the things that were going on in our life and all the things that we're doing and all the balls that we're trying to balance and everything that's taking place, I really think Jesus is elated. He's excited. He is thrilled when we say, Lord, can I be with you? Can I spend some more time with you today? I believe it was a very, very exciting, pleasing moment in the life of Jesus as Peter was reaching out with those words. Can I come to you? Can I come to you? But then we've got to see here, we've got to stay focused. We learned this lesson from this story. Focus is pretty important. Why? But when Peter looked around, oh boy, there we go. When Peter looked around, here comes trouble. When Peter looked around at the high waves, he was terrified and he began to sink. And then he shouts out again, save me, save me, he shouts. Oh, do you have trouble staying focused? Yeah. Are you having trouble staying focused right now? Huh? What's for lunch? Huh? Hey, the clock back there says it's only 1025. I got another hour to preach. That's tremendous, isn't it? <laughs> Stay focused, Rich. It's 1130. <laughs> it's not 1030. Sometimes we have trouble staying focused. I know I do. Someone said something to me this week about staying focused, and they said, you know, I want to stay focused, but sometimes my mind just wanders, and I, and I, and I, you know, I want to talk to God all the time, and this and that and the other, and they were really, really bitten this story, and I said, well, let, let me just give you, let me just give you a, a little illustration. I said, Back when I was in Bible school, when I worked for this little company called Environmental Control, and when you're, in, where, when you're in Bible school, the best job you can have, or at least back in those days, was a janitorial job in the school system or, or for another company because it was evening work when the offices are closed and you go in there and do the cleaning. And so I worked for this little company called Environmental Control. And Ken White was, my, was the, the, the founder and the owner of that company, a great Christian man. And, uh, boy, I can still remember that as if it were yesterday. Boy. 
Good job, Rich. Anyway, so it was a long time ago. And I remember I got this friend of mine a job. And um, I said, I, Paul, I said, I said, go. I said, man, they're a great Christian company. I, and I said, man, I said, I can get you, I can get you, I can get you hired. So, so they, they, hired, they hired Paul. They hired him. And um, so a few days later, I was out and I was talking to Ken. And I, he came by where I was working. I said, I said, hey, I said, how, how's Paul doing? Well, he said, hey, see, Paul's a great guy. He said, but you know what? He said, Paul is almost so heavenly minded, he's of no earthly good. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? Oh, he said, Paul's a spiritual guy. Oh, he said, he always talks about God and everything. He said, but I don't know that if he really wants to work. <laughs> My point is this, we can stay focused on God and still work your job, okay? So that's not an out for you. You can stay focused on God and still have a family and still have hobbies and still have fun. Okay, but you know what? Staying focused on God is this, the lifestyle that I live, the life that I live, the Christ follower that I want to be is one that is following after Jesus in all the areas of my life. And no matter what's going on, I can stay in touch with him and I still feel and sense his presence. That's what I think it is to stay focused on God. You know, Peter was focused on the wind and the waves. And so many times we're focused on all those other things. They're true and they're happening and they're happenings in our life. But don't focus on those things. Stay focused on Jesus. That's a great lesson that we learn from this part of the story. And then number four, the fourth thing that Jesus tells them to do in the storm is said, don't doubt. Oh, really? Yeah, don't doubt. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and he caught him. Okay? And he said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And you think about it. Come on now, think about it. He came to them that gave them courage. He gave them reassurance and confidence. It is, it is I. Oh, thank you, God. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. Jesus is walking on the water. Peter was walking on the water. When he asked him, he said, can you just tell me to come to you? And Jesus said, come to me. He, he did. So no wonder Jesus said, why did you doubt? Come on. Why did he doubt? He was praying for them. He came to their rescue. He identified himself. They were relieved. Jesus told him to come. He walks on the water. And now he's starting to doubt. Why do we doubt? Just because there's a storm. Oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt, Peter? Doggone it, I just did all this other stuff. I know. No. Why do we doubt? Okay? So don't doubt. Simply, Jesus just says, don't doubt. Okay, then number six. <sighs> Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. Okay, now what is it? All right, when Jesus climbed into the boat, the winds died down and um, the storm stopped. And those who were on the boat, they worshipped him. <laughs> they worshipped him. He is worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our worship. He is a good, good father. He is Lord God Almighty. He's good God Almighty. So, praise him. A song that came out years ago, and my son Michael sings, I'll praise you in the storm. I'll praise you in the storm. I'll praise you in the storm. Let's praise him in the storm. I'm not going to tell you to praise him. You might get mad at me. I'm just going to, I mean, when you're in your storm, I'm telling you now because I don't know what storms you're in. But when you're really in a storm, and I know that you're really in the storm, I'm not going to say just praise God because I've told you now. I already told you. <laughs> so I don't want to tell you in the middle of that because you might get mad at me. Just praise God. Praise him. He is the one that gets us through every single 
battle in life every single time. So I have a question in closing, and that is this. How many storms is it going to take before you learn to trust God like they did? 30? 100? 2,000? How many storms is it going to take before you break out of your self-reliance and you begin to simply let God do his thing? Now, in closing, I'm going to say this. The best time to get this stuff down is when you're not in a storm, okay? Like you are this morning. Let's say that nobody's in a storm right now. Nobody's in a storm. So you're going to get this down right now. You're going to take notes. You're going to listen to the story. You're going to go home and reread the story. You're going to say, oh, wow, yeah, look what they did. Yeah, that was good. Okay. So you do that now and get it down. I'm serious. This is no joke. Then when the storm comes, when the storm comes, your spiritual maturity, your spiritual maturity in Jesus Christ is going to help you to weather the storm. That's the exciting part about this story. We're not where they were, obviously. I'm half scared of water anyway. Oh, I'm very scared of water unless I'm totally, totally, totally secure, okay? But here they were. They were in a massive, massive storm. And we see how it all came full circle. And at the end, they said, oh, my goodness, thank you, Lord. We praise you. We worship you. Okay? That's the lesson for the day. You feel like you're sinking? You're not alone. We've all been there. It's an awful feeling. I don't think you have to stay there. I really, really believe with all of my heart, you don't have to stay in that state of mind or in that condition or in that circumstance where you feel like you're just sinking, 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 sinking. You might say, well, Pastor Rich, but you have no clue what I'm going through. And you have never been in a storm like I am in. You know what? And you might be 100% right. And I don't take that lightly. I pray for you. I pray for you guys in your storms. I pray for you and your families in your storms and caring for your senior adult parents. And the whole list, the whole list that is going on. But we have got to reach a point where we begin to trust God, not ourselves.